Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us in these interview sessions we're holding for the upcoming 2023 Evanston Municipal Elections. Tonight, we'll be speaking with Sergio Hernandez Jr., who is running for District 65 School Board. Uh, my name is Tom Ozer. I'm joined by Kathy Hayes. We are both board members here at the Democratic Party of Evanston. Uh, the goal of these sessions is to help you be more informed about who's running for office. We'll have our endorsement session using the electronic voting that we've used before, open from February 19th to, uh, I believe, the 25th, uh, after which we'll uh, announce the results. So uh, without any further ado, uh, I'd like to hand things over to Kathy to get us started. Hello, and thank you all so very much. And thank you, Sergio, for taking your time with us this evening. I would like for um, our viewers, especially, to get to know a little bit more about you. So if you could take about 90 seconds to tell us a little bit more about who you are and, and uh, your membership on the board and so forth. Absolutely. Uh, again, I want to thank the Department, uh, the Democratic Party of Evanston for allowing me this opportunity as well as other candidates uh, to you know, share uh, why we want to run for office and represent the good people here of Evanston and Skokie, in my case. Uh, so my name is Sergio Hernandez, Jr. I'm the first Latine elected official in Evanston and the first Latine board president of the Evanston School, Skokie School District 65 School Board. I'm a husband and father of three boys, two who graduated from District 65 and one currently attending middle school. I'm a 25-year veteran bilingual educator, an early childhood advocate, and currently the equity lead at the Illinois State Board of Education, as well as a lifelong community activist. Uh, I've been in the school board for, I'd say it's gonna be over seven years. I was first appointed uh, and then ran unopposed uh, four years ago. Um, and I'll tell you what, even though I ran unopposed, I was out there actually uh, having meet, meets and greets because I really think it's important to continue to engage community. Uh, even if you're uh, running unopposed, right? Uh, it doesn't mean that you should coast. Um, I take uh, my role as a public servant very, very seriously. Uh, and I do want to make sure that I'm listening to our constituents and really trying to meet folks where they're at uh, as we continue to embark on uh, embedding equitable practices and policies across our school district and across our city of Evanston. Uh, so again, as I said, I've, I've been an, uh, again, I've been educating for over 25 years. Um, again, I was a bilingual educator, started in the Chicago public school systems um, or, uh, and then ended up moving over to uh, the Western suburbs following uh, my community. Uh, and, and trying to best serve uh, students in multilingual programs. So I can tell you that I've worked just about every grade. So I have that background of uh, being this educator. And if you're a bilingual teacher or a special education teacher, uh, again, you are to be expect you're assigned a, a certain uh, a grade level band, but you actually work with all kids and as well as all colleagues across a, uh, a school system. So again, I have this very uh, expansive knowledge of, of, of what uh, students need and particularly most marginalized students. Uh, I'm also, I also sit on a, on a board for uh, uh, the Youth Job Center. Uh, again, for me, I'm, I'm fascinated by the uh, trajectory, right? Where, where our children start in our early childhood programs and end up becoming college and career ready. So I also uh, have been a board member there uh, for the past two years. So that's a little bit about me, so I'll take any questions uh, from you. Yeah. And we have several. Sure. Tom, you want to go to the next question? Absolutely. So we'll dive right into it. Uh, with the pandemic having uh, forced the district to adapt to distance learning, how would you characterize provided accommodations, both for the general student population as well as, and perhaps even especially when it comes to disabled students? And Given what we've, you have seen over the last two years, what changes, if any, would you like to see made to these programs? Yeah, so, you know, as our community and school district continues to recover from the current pandemic, right, it's critical that we all work together uh, within the school community, as well as with our community institutional partners to operationalize and normal, normalize equitable access to the resources our students and families need to succeed in their lives and in their community. Uh, spe specifically for our marginalized uh, you know, students, um, and particularly those with our most need are our students with multilingual needs as well as special education needs. Uh, again, 
just like any other school district uh, across the country that, that was impacted by COVID, uh, you know, we're, we, uh, we, we still have a, quite a bit of work to do in regards to trying to close the gap, uh, the opportunity gap for our special education students. One of the things that we've done is we really uh, are investing this year uh, in building relationships, right? Uh, rebuilding relationships. Uh, that's where we start, right? I think as an educator, one of the things that I would tell parents, uh, and they would be surprised by this, uh, particularly our Latino parents, is uh, I would ask them point blank when they would come for, for our parent-teacher uh, visits to, for report card pickup days, I would say, what is it that your child loves and cares about? You're the expert of your child. And I want to be, you know, I, I may have a master's degree in education. Uh, I might wear a tie because I used to wear ties as an educator and try to be formal. But at the end of the day, uh, you, you know, uh, parents and caretakers are, are, are the first teachers of their children. So how do we meet folks uh, where they're at and really identify what the needs are uh, that they have and then meet them where they're at? Um, so one of the things we've done, for instance, since, since School District 65 is we've started a uh, uh, a, a, a uh, a uh, special education um, uh, advisory committee that's made up of parents who, with children who have IEPs and special education needs. Uh, and of course, they provide us recommendations uh, in regards to how we should proceed and also help us identify uh, issues that they've been dealing with. Uh, and, and, and trust me that they've, they've shared with us uh, some of the ways that we can better uh, uh, you know, serve their students. Uh, some of the, one of the th strategies that they, they, they propose and, and, and is a best practice is inclusion practices, right? So an inclusion practice for a special education student would me mean that, again, we need to ensure uh, that students are being included in uh, most of our general uh, education class activities and that, th that they're not isolated uh, in special education classrooms, which was uh, is not a good practice. So we've been trying to train educators on, on the concepts of co-teaching uh, with special education uh, specialists uh, in order to ensure that children are not excluded from our, our, our general education classes, but they have this equitable access uh, to, to, to classroom experiences as well as uh, the rigor uh, of, of our curriculum. Uh, for our multilingual students, I can tell you, uh, again, uh, seven years ago, prior to becoming a student, uh, a, a school board member, uh, I actually was uh, a part of a, a community group that was trying to advocate uh, to ensure that we get better services for our Black and Latino students, uh, special education students, as well as early childhood students. Uh, and one thing that we really made clear uh, and that I learned about uh, was around uh, expanding e uh, uh, bilingual and ESL services for multilingual students. I found out that our, uh, our some of our schools were actually uh, asking parents to make a choice. Uh, so if your child, for instance, uh, we had one a couple of parents share with me that uh, if you needed, if your child needed both special education services and multilingual services, uh, they couldn't have both. Uh, they had to choose one, uh, and that's illegal uh, by federal law. If it's if a child is screened for uh, a, a special education services or multilingual services or both, they need to get those services, and we and our district needs to find a way. Uh, so again, we've changed that. Uh, there were a couple of schools that didn't even offer ESL services and would send students to some of our uh, schools that did have ESL or bilingual services. Um, again, in my tenure uh, it, as a school board member, we've expanded services in every school. Uh, every one of our schools uh, in School District 65 now offers uh, ESL services and, sh and particularly uh, shelter instructional uh, services for our ESL uh, students. So again, it, we, we've expanded that. So again, that's how we've served our, our, our most uh, our students with most need, which are our multilingual as well as uh, students with IEPs and, and special education needs. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. The, my next question for you is, and I know it's a pretty difficult question, but I think you'll be able to give us some great insight. With the district posting declines in enrollment numbers and continual structural increases in expenses, um, what my question is, what programs or initiatives or areas do you see as a top to, come top to your mind uh, to look at for savings, budgeting? Budgeting is a very big deal with school districts all over the country. What things come to your mind? Yeah, so in regards to budgeting, again, like you, like you said, Kathy, you know, we're, we're seeing declines as many school districts across uh, the country are, are seeing declines in, uh, in enrollments. Uh, so one of the things we really want to do is invest in making sure that we recruit families 
and, and try to bring them back to, to our school district, right? Um, and that's through, again, relationship building and working in collaboration with uh, local institutions like the city of, uh, of Evanston, uh, as well as community partners and organizations uh, to encourage uh, and help bring up our enrollment numbers in, in our early childhood centers, uh, as well as in kindergarten. Uh, so I think we can do a much better job in regards to recruiting more, more families. Um, as you know, uh, you know, get, uh, living in Evanston is, is becoming more expensive, right? So one of the things that I've proposed um, at our, uh, uh, we have we have three meetings uh, a year with the uh, with the school in our school city liaison committee uh, meetings, uh, and one of the things that I propose is we talk about and and, and try to. Uh, collaborate and co-lead in regards to discussing uh, some of the root causes of, of uh, uh, the declines in enrollment, which again, they, they are the increased cost of living here in Evanston, as, as well as um, the, uh, you know, again, a, a crisis in affordable housing. So, um, you know, one of, that's one of the things that we really, I think, I really want to continue to uh, push is that we, we as a school district can't do this alone. Uh, and each institution needs each other uh, in order for us to find a, a, a collaborative solution uh, to, to close uh, uh, to, to provide resources to families uh, in our community in order for them to stay and also to keep our diversity, right, which I believe is our strength. So again, working closely with, with our institutional partners as well as community organizations uh, like Cradle to, through Cradle to Career, uh, through, uh, again, through our local churches, uh, to to really try to figure out what services folks need in order to help keep uh, uh, the current diverse uh, community members that we have uh, in, in this wonderful community. And uh, you've spoke so eloquently about the issues of, of racial diversity, uh, keeping with the threat of changes or reductions in services and reduction in numbers, would we be able, or how would do you think we would be able to keep the district's um, racial and educational equity standards and policies in place? The community is changing. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, you know, the census numbers are are, 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 again, are showing that change, right? I mean, we've seen a steady decline of our, of our diversity, and particularly in our Black community. We did see a slight uptick in, in our Latin Latinx community, Latinx community. Um, but but you're absolutely right. I think one of the things that we really want to do, we're utilizing the student assignment project. Uh, and again, we've hired a firm to, uh, as we re reconsider our boundaries, right? Uh, and really um, utilize Cordelia and Clark uh, to kind of help us examine uh, the all different aspects of our, of, of our school district in order for us to make wise budget decisions around how we right size our school district so that may mean maybe closing a school or two because of declining enrollment. Uh, maybe, uh, um, you know, one of the things that we're proposing, for instance, is in, in the new Fifth Ward School, uh, we're, we're going to bring in uh, um, the current staff of Bessie Road School. Uh, many of the students that go to Bessie Road already live in the Fifth Ward. So it, it's a natural transition. So it'll be a school within a school that provides multilingual services within, um, you know, uh, that'll, that'll provide multilingual services within the new fifth ward school. So, we, you know, being very, uh, you know, look, looking at the data that we've collected through uh, through the, the student assignment process uh, is, is, is going to be helpful as we continue to try to figure out how to make sure that we're right sizing our district. And, and again, um, utilize, uh, you know, spend uh, really, you know, prioritizing how the budget can continue to support uh, equity, uh, the, the operationalizing of, of equity uh, and access to the resources that our current students and families need to succeed uh, in our school district and in Evanston. That is, I'm glad you brought up the Fifth Ward School, and I'd like to <clears throat> stay on that for a moment, but let's discuss it from the uh, angle of community. Uh, we'd like to know how many community engagement meetings regarding the new Fifth Ward School you have attended, and more broadly, um, how have you decided or what are your goals for strategically envisioning the challenge of building a neighborhood school without crowding out historically Black spaces and creating gentrification challenges? Yeah, that's a really good one. Um, so uh, we have 
uh, you know, I attended uh, last month's, I think in December, it was December, we, we had a uh, meeting in collaboration with the city of Evanston to have a conversation with folks. We had had our own uh, conversation around the fifth ward school through our SAP process all through 2021, 2022. Uh, so again, for the student assignment process, I was part of that. Com uh, I, I want to say about 10 of the 20 meetings that we held uh, in, in, in the student assignment uh, planning process with several community members from, uh, from, from across Evanston and from our different schools and staff as well. So, so you know, I, I participated in those and I will be participating in the upcoming um, uh, community meetings that we're going to be having in, in the fifth ward. Um, uh, I know we had one on, on Saturday with Jordan, so I'll be attending mm -hmm. tomorrow. Uh, so folks who want to come out, uh, I know we will be having a, uh, a session tomorrow. I don't remember the location, but again, I'm uh, happy to get back to folks on that uh, regarding uh, th that particular meeting. That's happening tomorrow. It's, uh, it's I believe, 6.30. Uh, so I will be at that as well as subsequent uh, community engagement uh, opportunities to really hear uh, from folks in regards to how we uh, uh, you know, design the school in a way that honors um, the history of, of, of the historical Black Fifth Ward, uh, and also honors the the, the upcoming La Latino population in that in that uh, in that community as well, right? Um, and, and and ensuring that we're working in collaboration and not just dictating what's going to happen. Um, so so looking forward to those conversations. Uh, and as you know, we we did try to work with the city uh, uh, city of Evanston as they considered. Um, you know, looking at Fleetwood Jordan and, uh, and, and, um, and now, of course, we've decoupled with them for the meantime. Uh, but again, we, we, we continue to, we will continue to be uh, good institutional partners as, as we both uh, move forward with our specific projects in order to, again, try to honor the, the spaces that, that uh, Fifth Ward residents have historically uh, utilized uh, and, and, and don't want to lose uh, and also want to gain uh, something that they've lost through the Fifth Ward School, right? Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for, for responding to that. I, I am a former Fifth Warder, so <laughs> it is very dear and near to our, our hearts uh, as well. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about structure and systematic issues regarding K through K, pre-K, I should say, um, involvement and inclusion. The governor in his inaugural address made a very um, large plea in making education available pre-K because that's the start of the real start of an educational role for children um, that could really boost them to a whole different level. So um, my question to you is, what can District 65 do to meet these challenges proactively? Usually when there's a blanket statement regarding the governor or entities outside of the uh, initial district, you have to scramble to catch up with some of those things. So what are some of the plans to do it proactively at District 65 under your tenure? Yeah, so again, you know, one of the things that I ran in my first campaign was to improve uh, uh, early childhood outcomes. Um, and um, one of the things I, um, we, we did under my tenure in the past four years was we had a summit uh, between uh, all the early childhood programs, not just, not just the programs at, at our JEH Early Childhood Center, but uh, uh, community neighborhood programs. And, they, and uh, I know that there's a group that meets already uh, I think it's called the Kindergarten Readiness Group that, that, that meets already uh, to collaborate and coordinate, um, you know, the, the, the strategy in regards to recruiting uh, students and, and, and sharing available seats in early childhood. Um, so one of the things uh, that I wanted to see was uh, collaboration now between uh, our, our early childhood teachers at the JEH Center, as well as our community, uh, uh, community-based uh, early childhood uh, centers and our kindergarten teachers to ensure uh, a smooth transition uh, between from early childhood to uh, the K-12 system. Yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you one of the things that we're very proud of under our tenure is, is that we close the 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 uh, racial opportunity the racial opportunity gap uh, in uh, the JEH center program. Uh, so only 31, you know, prior to some of the work that we've done uh, with early childhood and trying to enhance it and improve it, only 31% 31, 31 of our, uh, our, our pre-K students were showing up uh, kindergarten ready. 
uh, we are up to 78% of those students, according to our teaching strategies goal assessment, which again is a, is a holistic observational assessment that, that, that tests fine motor, gross motor, as well as uh, 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 yeah, uh, reading, writing, and, 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 and arithmetic uh, in, that, in the pre-K level. So again, it, it is, that's where we start. You're, you're absolutely right, Kathy, is that that's where we want to start. And then how do we build? on that success and how we close that, uh, that racial opportunity gap uh, from uh, early childhood on to uh, uh, when child, children and families make that transition to K-12. So that I think it, it, for me is the next step and the next challenge is, uh, you know, COVID of course messed up our plans. We used to get meet every year. We were doing consistently having our, our, our early childhood teachers meet with our kindergarten teachers. We're gonna try to restart again uh, uh, that this year uh, in order so, for, so folks can get on the same page in regards to the accomplishments that are uh, and the kindergarten learnings that our children are bringing to our K-12 system and then building on that success. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, what would you say that your positions are on some of the cultural and climate initiatives specifically that Dr. Horton has uh, started the last three years or so? Yeah, so, you know, we, we've done quite a few things in regards to trying to improve uh, climate and culture. Uh, as you know, we've had our challenges. Um, and, and one of the things that we, some of the things that we've done were, uh, is we really wanted to, I, I'm a big uh, family and community engagement uh, proponent. Uh, and I was actually formerly the director of family and community engagement uh, for two years over at the Illinois State Board of Education. So that is one of the big pushes that I have for, for our superintendent as an administration has always been we need to ensure that we engage in, in, in best practices around family and community engagement. So one of the things that we've adopted have been school concierges, right? So at, at every school, uh, in, 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 we, we've placed uh, folks, many from the community, uh, who, again, have a relationship uh, with community members to welcome folks, to help folks navigate uh, you know, the schools and, and, and the requirements within each of our respective schools and, and, and that respective uh, uh, school cultures. Um, we've also have a, we've hired family engagement specialists that focus on wraparound supports for our families in most need. Uh, so, so again, for me, it's one thing to engage a student, but again, the student comes from a family and, and, and the family is in a community. So, so it, I take this very bioecological view of, of how we need to engage families, right? I think with American education, the tendency is to kind of just look at individual student achievement, and then we disregard all of the things that they bring to, uh, to, to, our, uh, to our classroom settings. So when we can get to that point that, that we acknowledge that there's these, uh, these different needs as well as strengths that they bring to our classrooms, that's when we really can make a, a difference. Which is why I love early childhood because early childhood is designed to look at, at, at a child holistically, and we and we think about all of those pieces. That so, if a child uh, is not learning well, then we ask the parent, "What's going on? What supports do you need? What resources do you need?" Uh, and and early childhood provides those wraparounds. Uh, but as you move across the educational continuum, uh, that intentional asking for uh, of what supports families need and students need. Um, you know, it, it lessens. So we have tried to increase uh, uh, how we, how our school district and, and our staff engage families and, and, and assess need in order for them to be able to then give them the resources. And then they're able to come in to be their full selves and to be able to uh, uh, work to, towards the academic river that we want them to work up to. Wow. Um, thank you. Uh my next question, I, I usually get the budget questions. Sure. <laughs> the budget, the budget, the budget. Budget, yeah. It's always something, and, and all the growth and development you refer to is absolutely superb. It's just that now we need to talk about the budget. How, oh, several years ago, District 65 passed a funding referendum. Um, this referendum, by the way, was endorsed by this organization. Um, so the questions, or should I say the series of questions that I have, uh, we would like to hear from you, your thoughts in, on the current state of the District 65 budget. And after that, I'll have another question. Yeah, so the, the our, you know, we've won, an, so we won an award for the past couple of years from the Illinois State uh, Board of Education for our budgeting practices uh, because they're transparent. 
Uh, I know we we have our independent accounting firms that come and do audits. Uh, and again, I, you know, we we have a really good record in regards to maintaining uh, a good budget as well as good budget transparent budget practices. Um, so so I'm very proud of, of, of our administration and our school board. I mean, we really do try to pay attention to how we uh, spend our money. And, and really, we, um, you know, we, in the equity work that we've embarked upon as, as, as an organization, uh, it, you know, it's, you know, the, the budget tells you everything. So, so again, what we're spending, and that's to this aligns to what we promised to do because uh, I was part of that campaign too to promote uh, the the referendum. Um, it was to really try to maintain uh, some of the programming and and and, and the after school supports and resources and enrichment uh, that the activities that we have for kids. I remember uh, being in those very uh, 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 difficult. Uh, uh, conversations and board meetings when we were considering the referendum and, and of course, considering budget cuts, we were going to cut music, we were going to cut a couple of other programs that are just near and dear to all of us. Uh, things that I had never had as a kid, which now my kids were able to uh, to take advantage of, right? Uh, orchestra and theater and, and all that good stuff. Uh, so, so you know, I, I had a personal stake in it as well, because that's something that I did not grow up with and I did not have access to. Uh, so we've maintained that, and we've maintained the promise to our community uh, in, in maintaining that funding. Uh, we have not dipped into the reserves. We continue to add. Uh, we do project budget deficits still, uh, again, because of the declining uh, enrollment uh, as well as population, uh, you know, in our community. Uh, going back to some of those root causes, right, uh, you know, the uh, affordable housing, so which requires us, again, to, to, to have a conversation with our institutional partners who we share tax revenues with. Uh, and, 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 and try to think how we can be creative uh, in regards to ensuring that we, we have sustainable budgets to sustain the programming uh, that our community wants and needs and deserves. And, and I'm glad you said about the issues of transparency. Um, do you feel that the budget is transparent for the layman that is in the community, the parents that uh, this is, you know, doing your home budget is much different than having a 27% budget of taxes that um, are, are are leaned on for taxes. Do you think that the budget process that the district is involved with now, though it may be flush, um, even though you're projecting deficits later on down the road, um, do you think that that's been communicated to, I don't know, the community at large and, and parents? Yeah, so well, we're yeah, I, I think we've uh, we can we've done pretty well. I think what we do is we have a we have a document called budget at a glance, and it is a a, a very you know we have our of course our hundreds of page budget uh, book that we we put out every year, uh, and, and but that we've uh, I think since I started back in 2017 they had started initiating what's called a budget at a glance document, uh, and it's been reduced to I want to say a, a, a two sided uh, paper that, okay. that that kind of shows. Uh, the you know wh where our, our our budget is at in regards to uh, expenditures and revenue, so that's one attempt uh, to to really try to make sure that our, our community understands. And that goes out on a mailer and snail mail. It's available in um, uh, it, in our website. So again, we try to communicate that out to the community as clear as possible, and again, make it accessible uh, for folks to understand uh, you know where 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 our finances is at in that particular fiscal year. Mm, wonderful. We've briefly touched tonight on the subject of declining enrollments and how it's affected the budget. Uh, to that end, uh, we, are you in favor or opposed to school district consolidation in Evanston? Uh, and what do you think you would need to know to make up your mind as to the subject of consolidation? Um, so I had a... Um... I want to say I want to say about eight years ago, um, I had gone to a I was part of a a, a, a policy fellowship, the Illinois Early Childhood Fellowship, uh, and uh, this was about I want to say eight to nine years ago, and I'd gone to a presentation around um, school school district consolidation done by former um, assistant governor, uh, I mean, she was the daughter of uh, Paul Simon. Uh, 
Uh, I can't remember her name, but she she had done got a blue ribbon panel as we do blue ribbon panels <laughs> to study such you know, issues and, and topics such as this. Uh, and the recommendation came out that it actually would not uh, be very beneficial and or really you wouldn't really see that many savings if you consolidate school districts. It really depends on, on the size, right? So mm -hmm. really, you know, and and and, and, um, and the capacity. Um, so I so. One of the things that, that I'm very proud of in regards to our collaboration with 202 is that, and what was suggested through, from the report and the recommendations from the former uh, 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 assistant governor uh, was that uh, you do what's called a, uh, a, uh, um, a shared services consolidation. So for instance, you know, we, one of the services that we, we save money on is, is food, providing food to our students uh, at lunch. And so ETHS provides, uh, uh, you know, their food services, and we, and, and again, we we've collaborated in a couple of contracts around transportation and and and, and all that other good stuff. Um, so if you can share services, right, which goes back to that piece around working with other institutions, right, to see how we can complement each other's budgets and 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 much and be much better about um, being creative in regards to how we maybe share. Uh, services that we provide to our students uh, and through and through our city residents, right? Uh, in order to uh, not duplicate services, uh, but provide this consolidated approach to providing services to community members, uh, uh, and in, in, in essence, also having uh, cost savings by doing that. So, so again, I I would be in favor of it. Uh, it if, if if somebody can show me that there's cost savings attached to it, I think you know one of the examples folks give, like let's say we do a school district, we have a school district consolidation. Um, we think about teacher contracts. Um, so the high school may be paid more, or they uh, may, may have made an agreement with with their union uh, around paying their, their, their teachers a little bit more in salary. Uh, and again, I'm, for, I'm all for supporting our teachers as much as possible, right? Uh, it's financially and what have you. But again, that the, the savings that we would have realized in the services would be eaten up perhaps by a, a contract that a teacher contract uh, that that raises salaries and benefits uh, that in a way that again erase whatever other savings were, were in, in regards to operational budget. So so again, that that's kind of the challenge there, right? Uh, so so. So I, right now I'm, I'm happy with the way, and, and I think there's still more work to do in regards to seeing how we as different institutions, city of Evanston, uh, the end school districts can, can find ways to provide shared services uh, in order to give a cost savings across the board uh, in, 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 within our respective taxing streams. Okay. Well, um, Mr. Hernandez, you have been on the board how long? Seven years seven years and you are currently your position on the board is president I'm on board president yeah yes you are congratulations i would like to ask you some some closing press uh questions because we're about to wrap up here uh when you first joined seven years ago what was your top priority and do you think you've met that priority to your satisfaction that's my one question yeah. Um, so my top priority is really trying to embed and operationalize equitable access to our most marginalized families, right? I believe that we all need access to the resources we need uh, in order to succeed uh, and become these successful citizens and, and prepared citizens, uh, critical thinking citizens uh, here in Evanston and, 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 and in the world. Um, so again, I grew up um, not having many resources. Um, you know, my parents are immigrants from Mexico. Uh, we had a hard time navigating the school system. I went to school in Chicago public schools. I'm a public school kid for, kid for life. Uh, and, uh, and I did do some, uh, my high school in, in, in Hillside, Illinois. So I did some, some suburban uh, schooling. Um, so I can tell you that um, it, it was a struggle to, to figure out whether, you know, how to go to college and what that process looked like. Uh, the transitions were hard, you know, you know, going from kindergarten to uh, to, 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 to grammar school and then to the high school and kind of just figuring out. And, and each time we made a transition, you know, I, I'd fall behind academically. I was catching up, then I'd fall back. Uh, and even in college, like I was doing really well in high school. And then just because I, I didn't know how it all worked, uh, it, I, it took me a while to, to, to get my degrees. 
Uh, all right, again, I hold a master's degree, but it took me uh, twice as long as it takes somebody who has the resources, who knows how to navigate systems uh, to, you know, to get to where I'm at today. Um, so, you know, my hope, it, it, my, my priority was that I didn't want any other child or family to experience that, that we as systems can be much better in coordinating, collaborating to bring, to bring forth the services and resources and access to those resources to help families navigate uh, and, and, and ensure that, 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 that their children as well as themselves are, are able to be successful in our community. So, so I think I, I, I've succeeded in some of that uh, by, do, you know, by, by again, helping uh, create some policies. I was policy chair for a bit and we, we brought in, uh, we detract algebra. So we created algebra for all where we give students extra supports. We know all children are mathematicians, right? That it isn't just the kids who have access, uh, but we, if you give kids the extra supports that they need, they can rise up to the challenge as well. Um, so we were able to do that under my watch as, a, as, as policy chair. And we've worked in collaboration with teachers. The teachers helped us come up with a plan on how to do that. So again, for me, it's about, again, creating and sustaining these relationships and co-leading with our educators, with our community members uh, to create uh, one of the best school systems in the country. Uh, so again, we've got a lot of work to do. Of course, COVID-19 threw a wrench, not only in our district, but districts across the country. Uh, so we want to reimagine education in a way that, again, honors relationships first, that ensures that children's needs are met in order for them to succeed and achieve at the rigor we want them to, uh, uh, and level that we want them to achieve in. Uh, so, so that's a lot of work. And, and historically, right, we've only focused on the, on the symptoms, right? Oh, so, oh, let's look at literacy scores, right? Uh, and, and, and try to tackle that. Oh, let's look at math scores and let's tackle that. Or we need more STEM. No, what we need to do is we need, we, we, we're, we're looking at a systems approach and, and, we're, and, and when we change system and transform systems, then that's gonna address the symptoms that we've been trying to address for so long. So that I think is, 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 is the work that I've been trying to do. I've accomplished some of it. I want to be given the opportunity to continue the work on behalf of this community and all families, but particularly our most marginalized families here in Evans. Now, you've hit on some of the things that you're most pr proud of in your tenure there um, as, as you worked through the ranks to, and ended up as president. Can you tell us what you disagreed with with the board? It's one of the decisions you disagreed that the board made that she's like, mm, I don't, I don't like that one. We should try something else. Okay. So even though I supported the uh, the referendum, uh, I was a bit hesitant because I kind of uh, I knew that it, at some point. It would it, it, it could impact uh, the livability, right, uh, and, and affordability of uh, of of living in this community. Um, but knowing that you know I, I was part of a group that was going you know an organization that was really going to dig into um, to do the hard work to really start. Okay, well, let I did not want to lose. Uh, any of the special programs and enrichment, as well as the equity work that we were doing, right? We couldn't do it. If, if, if we couldn't be doing this work and made all these accomplishments that we made if it wasn't for the referendum. So I can tell you that right off the bat. But I was hesitant at first because I just knew that the, 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 it could impact how uh, you know the, again the, the affordability in 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 in, in, in this community. But. I supported it because I knew that I, that, that I can make a change and I can make an impact along with my board colleagues and in collaboration with, with our institutional partners to really dig into the core issues and the root issues of, 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 of affordability uh, in, in this community. So, and that's what I want to dig into, uh, you know, in, in, if I were to be lucky enough to be chosen again to, rep, to, to be part of the board is to work with across institutions. Uh, to be more thoughtful in regards to how we provide resources and, and provide affordability and, and, and address root causes uh, that, that, that are causing uh, issues for, for our families here in Evanston. So, so that I think is, is for me is the next level of, of go governing, right? Where we can't do the work in silos anymore. The, the pandemic has taught us that, right? That, that again, you, uh, you know, some families were, were totally comfortable and well off, but the families who weren't, 
uh, again, had to find ways and networks and, and mutual aid groups to, to, to support one another. And even the folks who were privileged were, came in and worked in those mutual aid groups. And I was part of those mutual aid groups, helping folks out, uh, you know, taking food to their homes. Uh, and, and, and for folks, again, we, we can all as a community work together to really solve some of our more pressing issues uh, and move away from the from the pre-COVID uh, belief that we need to do, we need to stay in our own lane. We can't stay in our own lane. For some things you may have to, but for most things, particularly some of our social ills, we can't. We, we need to work together. Okay. Well, Sergio, I would like to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us and to answer these questions, which I know are going to be of great value to the voters of Evanston. Uh, before we end tonight, is there anything uh, that you would uh, like the voters to know that we didn't cover this evening? I, I think I've pretty much laid out my heart here. I, again, I really love this community. I, I want to be somebody who, a public servant uh, who co-leads and, and listens and continues to listen and, and meet the needs of all of our community members. So I'd love to be given the opportunity to continue that work and uh, and representing my community uh, and bringing this diverse perspective that have been missing for so long. Again, I'm the first Latin elected along with my colleague, Rebecca Mendoza, she was elected as well uh, as, as, a, as a board member. Uh, but uh, again, so so I, I hold the distinction and I do wanna be that voice uh, to, that, that again, uh, brings uh, a, a diverse perspective, uh, which again is our strength as a community. So again, our strength is our diversity uh, and, 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 I, and I wanna help maintain that diversity in my role as a school board member and in collaboration with our institutional partners across and, and community organization partners across uh, Evanston and Skokie. That's excellent. So uh, with that, we will end our interview for the evening. Uh, thank you all for watching this as you are watching this and please don't forget to vote. <laughs>